hello everyone. So this is this is scaling AppSec through education. Um, just a quick who we are: uh, secure delivery. Um, the takeaways from the slide are that we do this sort of thing commercially. That we do this at scale with some large companies, um, but it's all built on OWASP projects, uh, especially the OWASP Open Application Security Curriculum, of which I am one of the project leads. Um, I also lead the OWASP Cornucopia project with Colin Wilson, and I'm currently on the global board. Uh, Takeaway from this slide is my handle, REWTD, root demon, under which you'll find me on the R Slack, on Twitter, LinkedIn. My DMs are open, so please give me feedback on the things that you hear today. So this is scaling application security in large organizations, um, and we have very little time. So I forgive me up front, this is going to be a, a, a very uh, compact, very dense talk, um, but let's continue the conversation afterwards. So to start thinking about application security, we're going to first define it, put a little box around it so that we're clear on what it is exactly we're covering. Cybersecurity is very broad. Um, it covers uh, corporate identity, email security, desktop OS updating, uh, file shares, especially recently, printers, and there's a lot going on. Um, but we're concerned with the part of cybersecurity that you have to deal with when you're building your own software. Um, so the systems can be as secure as designed and built, but they're also the ways that how you're building them can screw you over from a security point of view. So someone could push you know, production passwords uh, or cloud API keys to a public repository. A sketchy person can uh, approach one of the developers in your team outside of work and offer them an eye-watering amount of money. Uh, just to add a little back door. Um, supply chain attack. Uh, open source library you use could get some nasty code introduced to it. Um, and you pull it on, on the next build of your system. You're not aware that it's there. There are many, many more ways. So if we're talking about the quality of supply chains, materials, value add activities, and design and manufacturing processes, then what we actually mean by application security is product security. That's pretty clear, but security as an intrinsic quality of system sounds a bit philosophical. So let's try and define that a little bit too. This is the ISO IEC 25010. Uh, the system and software quality model. Generally, um, ISO models are designed left to right of importance. Quality model is connected to how systems provide value. So, you know, most important is uh, furthest left. You might think that reliability is more important, but with a system, if a system has five nines uptime, but that's incredibly slow to use, you're gonna see that, that you know, your customers drop off and your customers will find it completely useless. Now, Security sits on the border between things that people care about, the non-functionals that people care about and that can easily see, and the non-functionals that people don't care about much and can't really see. Um, for example, if, if I pushed a change to production that negatively impacted performance, it would immediately be visible. Our customers would know it. Uh, they, would, they would complain. They'd be, they'd, they'd be held to pay. Um, if I pushed a change to production that negatively impacted security, something might happen, but something might never happen. And as Toby is fond of saying, hope is not a strategy. When deadlines pinch or resources get limited, um, it's pretty predictable that you'll see that these qualities will drop away uh, from right to left, leaving ultimately just functional, the thing works. Um, this, in addition to you know, uh, the team simply being unaware of the requirements that might be in place for security for a particular non-functional security in my case is when you end up with technical debt. Whenever I say the word technical debt or whenever somebody at Secure Delivery says the word technical debt, what you should think about is low quality because it's all about quality. So product security is one aspect of its overall quality. So how do we ensure appropriate high levels of security quality exist? Well, a pretty common way to think about many security is this, this line, where rapid delivery of changes to production, so at one end of the scale, uh, being secure is at the other end. And as an organization, you kind of pick somewhere on there, this is where our, our comfortable spot is. This is what we're happy with. It makes intuitive sense because as human beings, we, we think about moving quickly as carrying some level of risk, like driving a car at high speeds. Um, the problem with that intuition when applied to application delivery is that it's completely wrong. Um, I'm not saying that we should rush everything, it'll be fine, but rapid delivery and high quality are not opposed to each other. In fact, they complement each other, they work well together. 
having the ability to develop and release changes to production quickly means that you can more quickly respond to issues, find the issues and fix them quicker, security issues quicker. Uh, you probably have automated deployment processes, which removes you know, a, an, error, an, an element of human error, um, opportunities for, for malicious intent or uh, other reliability on other aspects. You probably have automated testing processes, which increases the functional correctness, the things that we care about, things that most people care about, and the other non-functionals, because you're regularly testing that you're not seeing any backsliding in that area. Um, you've probably got code that's clear, straightforward, easy to extend. You're not handing off changes to other teams for assurance or for deployment. Uh, these things are just advantages, both from a security point of view and from a quality point of view. You can't deliver at pace unless you're paying attention to the non-functionals. It's just not possible. Performance, interoperable, reliable, usable, maintainable, secure systems can be changed with confidence. Low quality systems that are harder to change tend to be brittle, uh, unmaintainable, unreliable, insecure, slow. This low quality system simply can't be changed quickly. Uh, they'll functionally fall apart if you try to, and everyone is quite correctly scared to even attempt it. Every change leads to unpredictable failures in overly complex systems. Slowest release code projects tend to be the ones that have the lowest quality. Delivering slowly isn't more secure. It's fearful. And if you're afraid of changing a system, that system is not secure. Taking all of this into account, security incidents are trailing indicators of low software quality. Uh, the problem set in long before that incident happened. Training indicators confirm long-term trends, but they don't really help to predict them. Um, they're a terrible measure to base your organization decision-making on, and you shouldn't be choosing how you spend money uh, that way either. Um, which is why you know, massive rebudgeting and shakeup when you're responding to an incident is terrible, uh, but you know, that's generally where budget funding comes from. So how do we manage, manage security quality when we only have training indicators? Well, what we need to do is find something that aren't training. We need to find some leading indicators of software quality. Get ahead of any potential instance. So if we had training indicators, then uh, sorry, leading indicators, then we'd have a good measure to base our decisions on. So the four metrics that matter, these are, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on them. If, if you don't know about the four metrics that matter, you need to go out and get, get a copy of Accelerate. You need to read it. Um, but if you're doing well with these four metrics, you're delivering product at, you know, to your business, to your organization at the right speed, you're doing things the right way, you're delivering high quality product. You have good leading indicators of how high performing your high software quality delivery is. Now, these are obviously not you know, uh, absolute figures, they're very much relative. But um, if you notice that, that functional correctness doesn't actually impact any of these things, right? You can build a completely wrong system, a system that doesn't work, a system that doesn't do what your customers need it to, but we're really high quality. But non-functionals do impact all of these. So any one of the non-functionals is affecting a great deal of, a great deal affecting these, these uh, by these, these four metrics. So security is interesting uh, in that providing, improving security of systems doesn't actually improve these metrics except if, if that we do it the wrong way, if we, if we implement security features or implement security processes wrong, then we will negatively impact these things. So we need to aim for a, uh, as little, a minimal impact as possible while improving security. And we need to keep track of these metrics while doing it. So these metrics are useful to tell us that we're producing quality software. These metrics are also useful to tell us that we're not impeding the ability of the business to create software or to produce new versions with our security effects. <clears throat> and this study uh, of root causes of all uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures reported in the eight years from 2008 to 2016, um, essentially said that almost all uh, of our problems are in implementation in code. And it makes sense, right? There's there's only so many ways um, that you can mess up a configuration. There's only so many ways that you can design something incorrectly. Um, there are countless ways that you can screw up while coding. It's an incredibly complex endeavor. It's really hard to do. 
the traditional focus <clears throat> of cybersecurity, design reviews, config hardening, it, it tends to sit in this little box. It's useful, but it's it's not the whole picture. It's definitely not the whole picture. So most product security lies in preventing security defects in code from reaching production, fixing the ones that are already there, having a measure for uh, security defect density in code from a security testing tool. It's a good direct measure, metric for security quality. Um, but what, is, what are the next steps? Well, if we wanted to ensure performance in systems, right? Performance is easy because it's it's something that we measure. Uh, we we have we have a pretty good understanding of what performance code should look like and what that means for our end users. So let's start with performance and move on to security. Um, if we're going to be doing something from a security point of view, uh, from a from a performance point of view, we want to think about what that impact will be. Think about the performance impact of any change that we're going to make. We want to plan our architecture with performance in mind. Uh, we want to ensure that everyone knows how to write performant code in the languages and frameworks that we're using. Uh, we want to hire people with domain expertise on performance so they can help push performance as a, as a key component of what we're doing. So they can train our other users to make use of that. We're going to do, we're going to do peer review of code changes, looking for performance issues because you know, we, we now know what we should be looking for. Uh, we're going to share known performed code with the rest of the organization. Yeah? If we have uh, internal libraries that are exceptionally performed, we'll make sure that we use those everywhere. We'll make performance a key consideration when we select uh, third-party services or third-party libraries or third-party components. We'll automatically test all changes for any performance defects, any performance regressions um, on every commit. So that developers can see immediately, hey, I've made a change here and it'll affect the performance of the system. Catch it early, fix it early. We'll prioritize performance fixes in our backlogs, in our development cycles, because it's important to us. We'll inject telemetry to measure performance in production, to just to show how performant our systems are. And we'll investigate and fix any performance issues that we find in production, making sure that we keep that, you know, that standard high and publish our findings and publish what we've done to ensure that it's safe performant across the organization to improve more learning. We'll have responsibility and accountability for performance with the people who are building the systems. We'll make it their responsibility to make sure it stays performant. If we're going to do the same thing for security, it's going to be exactly the same, right? Now, some of this we can measure and we can make visible. We can have a record of developers who've had secure coding training. Um, we can have a team with only developers who haven't had uh, security training. We know that they're more likely to make security issues, cause security issues, so lower security quality. We can check GitLab uh, or GitHub or whatever your version control system is for evidence of pull requests and reviews that show that peer review is happening. Uh, we can check JIRA uh, or any other work tracking system for the age of items marked as security work to show that known issues aren't just being deprioritized or ignored. Uh, we can check build logs, test logs in our orchestration platforms for evidence of the security tool test runs. And we should have the security tools uh, in place, Daniel pointed out. And we can pull all these delivery metrics, direct code level security, testing output, and evidence, good ways of working together to create strong indicators that we have good product security under, the, under control. How do we do that at pace though? Well, we've already got an example in SRE, right? We have experts in the field of reliability uh, they build self-service platforms, uh, which is important so they don't become the bottleneck themselves. We have uh, SLO, service level objectives, because it costs a lot more to build a five nines or six nine system than a two nines one. Um, so agreeing what product requirements is, is pretty essential. We have service level indicators, which are relatively straightforward for reliability. Right? Is the system up or down? How long has it been down this month so far? And the offering model is pretty, pretty basic too. Uh, it's simple, it's data-driven, takes away all of that, that, that emotion about, uh, about what's going on. Um, it provides a self-regulating back pressure on the product team. So if they let reliability go down with changes to the system over time, they, it gets pushed back to them. Product team that has production support responsibility handed back to them has a strong incentive to now focus on those, those non-functionals, right? To get reliability back to where it needs to be. SRE won't take production support again until you know, reliability is back where it needs to be. Developers don't like being woken up 3.30 in the morning. So yeah, 
can we apply the same approach to security? Sure we can. Product security engineering. It's basically the same. Same as being part of it, it it's, it's just part of an engineering function. There's an adjustment required for some security teams to become that internal consultancy with an education focus, but a lot of teams are already doing that. A lot of organizations are already grouping systems based on criticality uh, with greater security requirements. So uh, critical systems uh, are also have also higher security requirements associated with them. So you just need to specify where the security level indicators need to be for each of those groups. We don't yet have one, we don't have one clear service level indicator. So we have to combine multiple indicators to create a composite SLI. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go out and get some other metrics around that, you know, like whether the devs have done the training, that sort of thing. Um, and how pairs to provide back pressure is going to vary from organization to organization, right? We, we made security visible through SLIs, but without back pressure, the product teams can't self-regulate for security. And unlike security, you're not going to get a series of like smaller security incidents that lead up to a big one. Um, failure, road in, failure mode in security is pretty immediate. Um, so you won't hear uh, this month, we've briefly been hacked twice. Um, so we need to ease back on feature work and focus more on security. Uh, so we don't get hacked anymore. Uh, that's, not, that's not something you'll ever hear. So we need to have strong incentives for product teams to keep the indicators where they need to be. Um, you'll need to be able to answer these questions. Who's contributing to the system? Who's helping with the code? Who's helping with the design? Who's making the product decisions? What subsystems make up the system? What components make up the subsystems? Which code repositories map to those? And from the bottom up, you need to go from source code that might be demonstrating a problem right away to the components, subsystems, systems that are built from that repository without ever asking people, right? People come and go, software tends to stick around usually longer than it should. If you can't do this from an engineering point of view, then the organization has no chance of getting its act together. And uh, it will no chance, have no chance to build high quality secure systems or respond to identified problems in the right way. So, I'm going to This brings us to secure software development training. So the how of it all. Um, so today I want to talk about the latest attempt OWASP has made to standardize and codify curriculum for secure software development. It is an OWASP initiative, and I'm a huge OWASP fan. I'm a huge fan of the open source approach to building stuff um, because things then happen in the open. Everyone, anyone can contribute. It also makes sense to use OWASP projects that set the standard for measuring software quality, like the ASVS. And that uh, the uh, and the standards for development maturity, like SAM, um, and to use the great work done in those areas. Uh, we also leverage Quanticopia, uh, although that's because it leverages the same projects and covers everything uh, from design principles as well. And the top ten, because that's where everything starts. Talking of starting, let's kick off with fundamentals. Uh, top ten, although there are uh, several of them is where most teams start to look at product security. And it's from the most common defects rather than how to build things right. But the original top 10, the one that's being updated this year, that's going to be talked about a lot today over the course of the next 24 hours, um, is still indirectly referenced by the PCI DSS despite not being a standard. It is a good place to start though. Uh, Andrew Van Stock, uh, who is the current top 10 project lead and the ED for OWASP, said at this year's developer summit that top 10 is a good place to learn to call from. So let's start there. This is the new top 10. Um, briefly, as I said, because there's going to be lots of presentations on it today and lots of people will be talking about it over the course of the next couple of weeks, are the items on the right side of this list. And the updates made a couple of changes to the list, although it seems that we're still stuck with, in with injection tax, but they have dropped slightly lower now. Um, mostly attention has been made to, to naming. It's been key grouping of types of attacks that we've seen previously. Um, and there are a few new ones. So if you look at the, the top 10 just broken up here a little bit, you're seeing that there's a lot more happening in building errors. Uh, there's been some renaming and shifting around of things. And as I said, there'll be lots of discussion about it today. Now, the ASC 101, or the ASC Foundation, uh, Application Security Curriculum Foundation, covers the top 10. Uh, this slide is directly taken out of the, the the sample presentation material for the ASC 101. 
Um, and this is what it covers. It's, it's who it's aimed at and, and it's uh, you know, what you need to know going into it. Um, there's a slide like this one uh, for each of the top 10 uh, with some speaker notes uh, that are based off of our expert experiences, team that's been involved in building it. Um, definitely go check it out. It can be found over here. And I'd like to just do a quick shout out to uh, HMRC, uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the UK tax department, who actually helped us build this piece of work. And you know, we're welcome, we're happy to contribute it back to OWASP and to, to us as a, as a foundation. But what comes after that basics? Well, for me, it's cornucopia. Um, because architecture is revolutionary and cornucopia allows developers to use knowledge they learn uh, through the game to evolve thinking about threads, modeling uh, as the architectures evolve. Um, cornucopia itself stands on the, the giants that follow, um, but it simplifies the more complex standards we're going to try and get to. And it creates a top five of places to consider doing security user stories or a spike or adding a security NFR or some acceptance criteria. Um, if you don't know it, Cornucopia is a game, a card game to be precise. It's based off of Adam Shostak's EOP, Elevation of Privilege. EOP covers gamifying threat modeling for security teams, while Cornucopia does the same thing for developers. Uh, the point of view simply shifts left slightly. Now I have hours of presentation and demonstration materials in Cornucopia. If you want to learn how to play, um, then you know, this video is a good place to start. And uh, feel free to reach out to me at RDWTT for a deck of cards or for beta access to the online version that we're currently working on. Uh, I have hours on these slides, so I'll just click straight through them. Um, the top five, as I said, is made of six suits. Uh, there is authentication, who you are, um, authorization, what you're allowed to do, session management, how often we check the auth, Cryptography, the secrets, the hashes, uh, the poor choices, you know what I mean? Anyway, moving right along. Data validation and encoding, making sure that everything crosses the security trust boundary is safe. And then a catch-all because stuff just never works out. Um, so how do we use Cornucopia as an educative tool though? Well, we play the game. Um, actually, as a security person, what you do is you teach developers the game and you give them the materials that come with the game and then let them play. Otherwise, it's a little bit like playing cards against humanity with your parents. Um, to cover off the do threat modeling part of things from a compliance perspective, you tag your stories and epics in JIRA, uh, you scan in your score sheet, um, and that gives you uh, something to show the auditors to, to feel fuzzy about. Uh, while well, you know that things are being done the right way. But how do you level up from that? Um, well, there are two possibilities, and this is where most of the work is still happening. To begin with, uh, wanting to make secure software development a skill that developers can gain while learning to code or learning the right coding practice. Most of us start coding very early, so you know, maybe it's not while you're learning to code. So we're targeting tertiary education firstly with an eye to develop skills into modules and then stack those modules up to cover the whole of build a secure thing space. Basically, uh, the ASVS is OWASP's answer to the question, what is the standard against which software can be measured for security? Because it is a standard. And as a standard, it has had to go through a lot of rigor and scrutiny. Although perhaps not, never more so than when Toby and I decided it would be a good basis for the curriculum. Um, the thousand foot view of the ASVS, in case you've never heard of it, there will be a presentation on it uh, today. But the first thing you need to know about the ASVS is that it's split into three levels. Um, each application, uh, each is applicable to a different type of app. Uh, level one uh, should be used on all apps and it can be tested for using DAS tools alone. Zap's a great way to test past, uh, test level one. Every app should try and get tested to level two. Um, but if you go beyond one, then you need to look at code and code review and code designs uh, to do full testing. Level three is for apps that are serious about security. Um, and if you, if you manage special categories of data or if you connect to systems that do, like bank accounts, patient records, then you should be looking here. There's also technically a level zero, uh, which is what any application assessed that didn't meet the requirements for at least level one is tagged as being. If you do use level zero in your organization, you probably wanna document what a pass at level uh, zero means, um, or just realize that it means it's been tested but didn't pass. 
The areas for uh, learning in the ATS cover everything from architecture, which is not tested in level one, through to details about configuration, which are very tested in level one. And it includes the domains from Cornucopia earlier. So authentication, access control, authorization, session management, validation, and cryptography. To assess at level three, though, is to cover off 286 requirements. So how do we break this down for teaching? Well, we break down all the ASPS requirements into actions and into terms. We group the terms into units and weigh the actions described against Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Bloom's taxonomy, or more accurately, the cognitive knowledge domain of that taxonomy describes six levels of learning from remember through to create. Um, it's a standard applied by educators around the world and being hierarchical in order to understand or to successfully understand, you need to first remember. Uh, to apply, you need to remember and understand. So remembering is retrieving, recognizing, recalling, relevant knowledge, long-term memory, understanding. There's details on each of them here. Well, uh, level six is technically possible. Um, we've not found cause for, for it to be in the ACS, ASC yet. We've also yet to see a level two. Um, the process is as follows. We take a requirement from the ACS like this one. Uh, we identify the actions. We then identify and collate the terms and we apply some magic to determine the blooms level required to fulfill that requirement. This results uh, in this, as the basis of the curriculum, what knowledge is required to build something that meets this requirement or to evaluate whether it does. Obviously the next steps here are to find information on each term or make a note to the standards authors, authors about the term uh, or add a knowledge-based article or some combination of the above and then build teaching materials for those terms grouped by those units. Now, when we covered off ASVS in the tertiary section, everything gleaned there can and must also become available through industry training. So imagine that all the previous work is also broken down into parts that can be consumed in one, two, or five, three, four, or five days uh, in increments that are grouped together in a, a job-shaped course with related modules rather than units that were previously discussed to build up the whole structure. All of this is still work in progress. In this section, we're going to talk about OWASAM, where ASVS is about building a secure thing. SAM is about building a thing securely. When it comes to telling folks uh, how they should build software securely, you need to be prescriptive, which is one of the reasons that uh, we've picked this SAM over something else. The other is, of course, that it's an OWASP project, and you may have noticed how much we like OWASP projects. Now, SAM is made up of five business functions uh, with each business function having a being a category of activities that organizations developing software must somehow perform. Each has uh, three related security practices, which are grouped, grouped security related activities to support them. Uh, security practices each have six activities grouped in logical flows divided into two streams and then split across uh, the three maturity levels, giving us a total of 90 odd requirements. Streams cover different aspects of a practice and have their own objectives, uh, aligning and linking the activities in the practice over the different levels. All of this, there will be presentations on today as well. Please actually go and, and listen to them. The learning universe in SAM cover activities from overall governance and education. Hey, that's a, an idea. Uh, all the way through to operational concerns like you know, managing incidents. As before with ASVS, we take down, take the activities and we break them into actions. And we take those and break them into terms and then go through the weighing process. There are fewer activities in SAM uh, than there are requirements in the ASVS, which is yay, that's good. Um, but the activities are more complex than. We follow the same process as before, this time gathering the actions from a given function slash practice slash stream and a given maturity level. We then group the actions and modules, and then the rest is identical. So how do we apply this training in practice? Well, foundations, just go out and get it. 
or have us come in and help to you to present it to your teams. Uh, we make it really live. Uh, we've got loads of success with it. Uh, we make use of some cool tools that, uh, that make it more interactive, more fun. Um, intermediate training, well, use the game. So play it with your teams. Reach out to us for a deck of cards or for beat access to the free and open digital edition or have us come and play with your teams and teach them to play uh, for you. Tertiary education and industry training is still a work in progress. Um, we've built parts of the whole, we're able to present them to your teams, but that's not the point. The point is for this to become a standard and for everyone to have access to all of it. We'll continue to build out what's there until that is the case. So what does the future hold? Well, help us to complete the mappings and to work on building modules and units and then creating slideshows and speaker notes. Uh, sponsor the project uh, like HMRC has by engaging with us or uh, through the OWASP grants process uh, that's listed here. There are really two organizations that are keen to get involved in this and I hope to be working with them over the course of the next couple of months to, to get the next, next pieces out there. Um, give us your feedback. My OWASP email address is there uh, along with my Twitter um, and I'm here on Slack as well. So reach out to me on Slack and chat to me there. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that this, I know it was incredibly fast, but I hope this was, uh, was a useful session for you all.